Hello, and welcome to the Science of Terragenesis. Episode 4, Atmospheric Pressure. Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn, founder of Edgeworks Entertainment and creator of Terragenesis. I just wanted to start off today with a big thank you to all the people who have been listening and leaving reviews for the podcast. This is the first episode I've recorded since episode 1 was released, and it's been amazing watching the response that the show has been getting. I'm having a great time making it, but knowing that people enjoy listening to it makes all the difference in the world. So please, keep spreading the word about the podcast, and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're subscribed. Not only do good reviews help us get visibility and new listeners, it's also a great way to share your thoughts on the show. Do you want the episodes to be longer or shorter? Are you interested in more deep science or more gameplay descriptions? That sort of thing. Believe me, we're reading every bit of feedback you send our way. And with that, let's get started with the new episode. Today we're going to be talking about the second core metric of terraforming, atmospheric pressure. The first thing that any kid learns about outer space is that there's no air. That's why we wear spacesuits, to hold in the air. Any sci-fi movie worth its salt includes a moment where the air starts leaking out of the spaceship, or else gets blown out in an instant when someone punctures the hull. Space is empty, and that means there's no air. Of course, it's a little more complicated than that. Interplanetary and interstellar space is mostly empty, but there are clouds of gas and dust scattered throughout the cosmos. And of course, planets and even moons can have a wide variety of atmospheres. Earth has the one that we're the most familiar with, but plenty of other worlds have them too. Mars has a very thin one, Venus has an incredibly thick one, even Titan, the moon of Saturn, has one. And then, of course, there are the gas giants, which have atmospheres thousands of times bigger than Earth's. Just like everything else when it comes to human habitability, there's a Goldilocks zone with atmospheric pressure. Too much pressure and you die, too little pressure and you die. It needs to be just right for humans to survive. Atmospheric pressure is hugely important for the habitability of a planet, and understanding how an atmosphere works is vital to any terraformer's efforts. Let's start with the basics. What even is atmospheric pressure? Well, it may seem like air is weightless, but it's really, really not. All the air around you, from the breeze on your face to the clouds way above your head, is being constantly pulled down by Earth's gravity. It's squeezing in around you, trying to get as low to the ground as it can, just like any object will fall toward the ground thanks to gravity. Atmospheric pressure is literally the weight of all that air above and around you, from the top of your head all the way to the edge of space, being squeezed down by the planet's gravity. The only difference is, air is lighter than most solids and liquids, so it can't press down as hard. But that's not to say it's not pressing down at all. In fact, at sea level, Earth's atmosphere presses with about 15 pounds per square inch of pressure. For you metric users, that's one kilogram for every square centimeter. Think of a 15-pound weight at the gym, or an especially heavy bowling ball. And now imagine there's one of those pressing on each and every square inch of your body. Not just your arms and shoulders and chest, but your eyes, your inner ears, the inside of your mouth and in between your toes. Every spot on your body that is exposed to air is getting 15 pounds of pressure per square inch every second of every day. And it's a good thing that it is, because our bodies are designed to require it. The reason astronauts need spacesuits isn't just to hold in the oxygen they breathe. It's because they need to maintain that air pressure to keep their bodies functioning. Expose a human being to the vacuum of space, where the air pressure is zero, and they will die in less than a minute. That's what makes air pressure so important for habitability. A person could walk around on Mars with an oxygen mask if the pressure is acceptable, but without the right atmospheric pressure, they need a full spacesuit to survive. So what goes into achieving the right atmospheric pressure, and how might we go about altering it on another world as part of the terraforming process? Well, the most important thing necessary for an atmosphere is gravity. Gravity is what keeps the gas molecules close to the surface of a world, squeezing down to create that oh-so-important pressure on the skin. The more gravity a planet or moon has, the more likely it is to hold an atmosphere. In order to increase the atmospheric pressure, one of two things needs to change. Either the gravity of the world, or the amount of gas around it. 
since changing the gravity of a planet requires space magic, altering the amount of gas on the planet is our main focus in terraforming. The other thing to know is that atmospheric pressure is not a single consistent number around the world. It varies slightly due to temperature, weather patterns, and latitude, but it especially varies based on altitude. Go up a mountain and you'll have less atmospheric pressure than you did by the beach. That's why it's harder to catch your breath at the top of a long hike. The air is literally thinner than you're used to. That's also why airplanes need to be pressurized, because they fly so high that the air isn't thick enough to breathe. Generally, when we talk about a planet's atmospheric pressure, we're using a planetary average at a given elevation. On Earth, that's usually sea level. Atmospheric pressure can be measured using different units of measurement. Oftentimes, people will use the cleverly named unit called atmospheres, in which the atmospheric pressure of Earth at sea level is one atmosphere. In your car's tires, it might be measured in PSI, or pounds per square inch, but in Terragenesis, we use the metric unit pascals, which in Earth's atmosphere is about 100,000 pascals of pressure. That unit is named after Blaise Pascal, a 17th century French scientist who was incapable of sitting for portraits without looking like you just walked in on him doing something shady. Look him up, you'll see what I mean. So, Earth's atmosphere has about 100,000 pascals of pressure. But how do the other planets and moons in our solar system measure up? Well, Mars has a wispy 600 pascals of pressure, or about half a percent of Earth's, so it's practically a vacuum. Meanwhile, Venus has a whopping 9 million pascals, which is thicker than seawater. Standing on Venus, if you could survive the boiling temperatures and sulfur-choked air, would crush you to death before too long. Titan, the frigid moon of Saturn, actually has a thicker atmosphere than Earth's, sitting around 150,000 pascals. Which brings us to an important point. A world's ability to hold onto an atmosphere is not only determined by its gravity, but also by its temperature. The hotter a gas is, the faster its molecules are moving. Just like a rocket can escape Earth's gravity by going really, really fast, so can air molecules, which means that the hotter a world is, the more likely it is to lose its atmosphere over time. And similarly, the colder a world is, the better it is at holding on to its atmosphere, even with less gravity to work with. This is how Titan is able to hold on to its atmosphere, despite having less surface gravity than the moon. It's so cold that the gases can't escape into space. Future terraformers will need to walk a careful line between warming up a planet enough to allow life to grow on the surface, but not so much that it makes it harder to retain its atmosphere over time. Once you have an atmosphere on a given planet or moon, either naturally or after building one up through terraforming, it has another important secondary effect. It retains heat. Layering an atmosphere on a planet is a lot like layering blankets on a bed. The more you have and the thicker they are, the warmer it will be under them. Different gases can retain different amounts of heat. For example, carbon dioxide is a very powerful greenhouse gas, and methane is even more potent. In Terragenesis, we don't really get into atmospheric composition beyond the level of breathable oxygen, which we'll talk about in the next episode. But in real life, it will be a very complex and important issue. What we do get into Terragenesis is the atmospheric retention of heat, which we talked about last episode, and which can have a huge impact on the nature and habitability of a world. Another secondary effect of atmospheric pressure is its influence on water. As everyone knows, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius and freezes at zero degrees Celsius. But this is actually only true at 100,000 pascals of air pressure, also known as sea level on Earth. The boiling and freezing points of water are determined by both temperature and pressure. Increase the atmospheric pressure, and both the boiling and freezing points of water will change. This is mentioned in Andy Weir's novel Artemis, in which no one can make a decent cup of coffee or tea on a lunar outpost because the atmospheric pressure is just 20,000 pascals, meaning that water boils at lukewarm temperatures. As a world is being terraformed, the final atmospheric pressure will have fascinating repercussions on things like the cuisine of the local culture, as it influences the boiling point of water. A planet with unusually high or low atmospheric pressure might be especially known for having good, or terrible, soups and hot drinks, regardless of what the local chefs try to produce. 
Finally, one other aspect of atmospheric pressure is worth mentioning, and that is the popular myth that terraforming Mars is impossible due to atmospheric loss from its lack of a magnetosphere. The idea is that solar radiation can strip away an atmosphere over time, ionizing gas molecules and heating them up until they can escape the gravity of the planet, unless that radiation is blocked by an active magnetic field like Earth's. Proponents of this idea argue that because Mars has no magnetic field, any terraforming efforts are doomed to fail because the atmosphere we add to Mars will just be stripped away again by the sun. This is a very common argument among people on the internet. And it's true that a planet's magnetosphere can shield it from a lot of the solar winds and radiation can strip away an atmosphere over time. But the truth is that it's a lot more complex than that. I'll be doing a full episode on things like the magnetosphere issue later on in the series. But for now, the key factor is that Mars's atmosphere is actually pretty well protected from solar winds, according to a Swedish study using the Mars Express spacecraft in 2017. And even if the solar winds did impact Mars's terraformed atmosphere, it would be a process that happened over millions of years, rather than being any kind of obstacle to hominization. The process of adding or removing an atmosphere for a planet is a huge and complex one, likely the most challenging of all the major terraforming requirements. In Terragenesis, there are three technologies used to increase atmospheric pressure and three to decrease it. For a world like Mars, where the challenge is to increase the pressure, you'd likely start with a facility called thermal dust. This is exactly what it sounds like, dark colored dust designed to absorb as much sunlight as possible and convert it into heat. Mars has huge polar caps of frozen carbon dioxide, also known as dry ice. By sprinkling this thermal dust onto the poles, we could begin to release the carbon dioxide and thicken the atmosphere. With luck, it would start a feedback loop, warming up the planet, which releases more carbon dioxide, which further warms up the planet, and so on. That would eventually release all the carbon dioxide stored at the poles, doing much of our work for us. This is also what Elon Musk is referring to when he talks about nuking Mars, rapidly releasing the CO2 stored in Mars's polar dry ice caps. Next up, we have a facility called the Atmogen Suite, which is an automated chemistry lab designed to produce atmospheric gases using basic ingredients. And finally, the Pocket Mine, which involves drilling down into the planet's crust to release gas pockets trapped within the rock. In its ultimate form, many people suggest shipping nitrogen and other gases from the atmospheres of other moons, for example, Titan, which has a nitrogen-rich atmosphere that is far too cold for humans, though that would be a colossal undertaking. On the other side, a world like Venus would require huge efforts at atmospheric reduction. For this, we need a whole different set of facilities, starting with the sequestration plant. This is a facility designed for compressing and storing tanks of processed gases underground to get them out of the air, which isn't elegant or particularly scalable, but it's decent for a tier one facility. The next on the list is the biofixture lab, which is sort of like the modern process of burning fossil fuels, but in reverse. Rather than digging up carbon-rich molecules from the ground and releasing them into the air, we capture atmospheric carbon using plant life and then compress it into solid blocks for storage underground, gradually removing more and more carbon from the air. And finally, the hydrogen processor uses a real-life chemistry process called the Bosch reaction to convert hydrogen and carbon dioxide into water and heat, allowing for both the reduction of atmosphere and the creation of surface water at the same time. Regardless of the processes involved, manipulating an atmosphere of an entire planet will be the single largest effort humanity has ever undertaken. It will require unimagined technologies and likely centuries of effort, but the payoff will be greater than any other endeavor our species has ever attempted. An entire planet ready to be filled with as much life and personality and history as Earth. That's it for another episode of The Science of Terragenesis. Next week, we'll be diving into the next major terraforming metric and the other major component of atmospheric engineering, breathable oxygen. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes, and in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, and Discord at Terragenesis Game. 
on Twitter at twitter.com slash settle the stars and on YouTube at youtube.com slash edgeworks entertainment. You can also check us out at edgeworksentertainment.com and terragenesisgame.com. And don't forget to leave a review for the podcast. It really does help. And if you haven't played it yet, be sure to check out the indie terraforming game Terragenesis, which is a free download on iOS, Android, and the Microsoft Store. Thanks for listening, folks. And as always, happy terraforming.